So first off, I want to say thank you, Dr. Mass, for taking the time out of your busy schedule to talk to us about your journey in the field of medicine. So I really appreciate it. Sure, I appreciate you having me. Okay, so first I'm going to introduce Dr. Alan Mass. Well, he graduated from Cornell University with honors. Uh, he received his medical degree from the NYU School of Medicine, where he served as a student body president. Additionally, he completed his urology residency at the NYU Hospital, Bellevue Hospital, Manhattan VA Hospital, where he served as the chief resident. Dr. Mass has authored numerous articles and textbook chapters in peer-reviewed urology journals and textbooks. He presented his work both nationally and internationally. So you have a lot of impressive accolades, Dr. Mass. I'm curious where it all began. So tell me a little bit about yourself growing up. Uh, what sure. were you like? What were your interests? Normal kid. Um, you know, obviously I, I, I always had a pre-inclination towards medicine. Um, I, I think it probably stemmed from when I was eight, I had my appendix taken out, okay. you know, and I experienced sort of what it felt like to be in a hospital and to go through a surgery and this and that. And I remember just not being scared. I, I remember mostly just asking questions about what was going on, being very interested in and everything uh, surrounding you know that that event, um, and it just sort of you know stemmed from that. I was always sort of more inclined towards the sciences. Um, I dissected a brain in sixth grade as a science project, you know that type of thing. Um, I, I think uh, you know I, my parents weren't doctors. I, I didn't really you know have much experience in terms of what it really meant to be a physician, um, but the. You know, the, the, the thought of me wanting to be a doctor was always somewhere there, and I, I always did things in, 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 in that realm um, to, to get, you know, on that pathway, I would say. Okay. So, so, would you say in high school you devoted some time to, let's say, volunteering, which many of our viewers have done to mm -hmm. research? I think, and we're in college even. Yeah, I, I mean, um, I, I used to work in a lab in high school. Uh, and I did research actually in conjunction with the, um, the Intel Science Talent Search, mm -hmm. you know. Um, so I worked in a lab. I did uh, research on uh, spinal cord injury with with mice and rat models. Um, I worked in a lab for about three summers, and also during the year here and there. Um, I I attended a summer program, uh, Na National Youth Leadership Forum in Medicine, which I'm not sure it exists anymore. I think it might. Um, and that was sort of a foray into, you know, that, that world, what it's like to be a physician. I shadow doctors then, and this and that. Um, some volunteering in hospitals, some volunteering in, um, you know, uh, like the local ambulance corps. Nothing uh, serious w with both of those things. Um, and, uh, you know, in college, um, it was more sort of, again, research. I did a semester in New York City where I shadowed a neurosurgeon for a semester and did research in his lab. Um, I went to Cornell, but it was a, something called Urban Semester, so I actually lived in New York City for that semester, and that's when I did the, you know, the shadowing there. Um, that was probably my first experience really shadowing a, a doctor um, earnestly for the first time and really understanding what it meant. Okay. You know. oh, that's actually interesting. So you shadowed a neurosurgeon. And um, but you ended up becoming a urologist. Mm -hmm. How exactly did that path lead you to become a uh, urologist instead of? I, I think the the thing that that experience showed me was that um, I, I liked the operating room. Mm -hmm. You know, in, in medical school, one of the first decisions that medical students make is: Do you like to be in the operating room and operate? Do you like to be more in the office? Um, and sort of thinking uh, about medicine more. Doing versus thinking is sort of, you know, medicine versus surgery, but um, I like both actually. And so I, I think that's one of the reasons why I was steered towards urology because we have a lot of, you know, office space procedures. We have a lot of patients that we, uh, you know, have on medications and there's a lot of thinking in, in terms of that, but there is also a lot of surgery. It's about 50 50 for most urologists. So like more of like the lifestyle in terms of work, right? So it's not only just being in the OR and it's not only just spending time in the office. You like a mixture. Of Today, for example, I was in the operating room in the morning and I had uh, an office. I just saw 30 patients in the afternoon and um, 
every day is pretty much split for me in that sense. Some days I am in the hospital and do more operations, um, but I'm always at least you know seeing patients about you know four half days a week, and I like that split because it, it, it you know um, I think doing only one thing every day could get a little boring, and this brings variety to the day. Definitely, we kind of rushed a little bit ahead. Um, I want to go back a little bit in time and. I want to talk about your pre-medical rehab because I know a lot of our viewers are during that stage in their careers and the pre-medical route is challenging and everyone understands that. What were some strategies that you undertook to achieve such great success on the path? Yeah, I mean, first of all, you really have to do well in, in the pre-med classes and um, I think, um, you know, there's no cutting corners. There's no cutting corner. You, you just have to study a lot. Mm -hmm. um, I think it, it was important for me to study with people. I think one of the things that, for me at least, and everyone's different, but one of the things for me was if you're in a group environment, teaching someone else the material is a really good way of understanding the material yourself. Um, I learned this when I was a TA for you know Bio 101 uh, when I was an older college student, um, I learned that uh, that really, if you if you teach someone something, that that knowledge is something that is is going through your brain in many different ways. Um, you know, you're not only writing it, you're you're thinking about it in a different way. And so I think that being in a group setting, having a study group, is very important for a lot of those pre-med type classes. Not only is it sort of you know a supportive type of environment because everyone's going through the same struggles and studying a lot and this and that, but, but it, it also, I think, drills the information into you a little bit better than just studying in a vacuum by yourself. Um, and you bounce ideas off of each other and someone has a good idea of how to understand a concept. There are a lot of mnemonics and ways of remembering information. Um, a lot of what we do in, in the pre-med classes is just, you know, rote memorization of, of a lot of, you know, huge pieces of information. and, and um, I think that doing it in a group setting is very important. Another thing is, um, you know, attending class every day. Some some people, you know, if you if you even slack off for a week or two weeks, it's really difficult to get back into the group to catch up. And um, just being diligent in terms of, you know, telling yourself, listen, um, there are only really eight courses that you need to do very well in. All of the other courses, it would be great to do well in, but you know, the organic chemistries, the inorganic chemistries, biologies, physics. Calculus, you really have to hammer those out and um, and make sure you do well in those classes no matter what. Right. That's actually a great point you're bringing up. So most people get caught up in the just the mundane nature of it and only, let's say, per one class. But if you think about it as a whole, that it's only eight classes that you have to succeed in, it makes the journey a lot shorter. And, and not only that, because those eight classes are what are on the MCAT. Exactly. You know? And so if you really master those classes while you're taking them, studying for the MCAT will be a lot easier, I think. Um, I, I didn't really have a traditional route in that sense. I actually took the MCAT when I was a sophomore, my, my uh, spring semester sophomore year. I had a few friends who were a year older than me, and I had, you know, uh, I, I, I was studying with them for other classes, and they were all gearing up for the MCAT, and I just told myself, you know what, I might as well just get it out of the way. Uh, it might have been a hasty decision, but I did well enough to get to where I wanted to be. Um, you know, perhaps I might have done a little bit better if I waited in another year. But I, I think um, you know that took off the stress in terms of the next two years because I already had that done. A lot of people, I think, wait a little bit too long after their classes are over. You take biology and inorganic chemistry your first year of college, and then you're taking the MCAT two years later, and that information might be you know long gone in terms of you don't remember it anymore. So I, I think taking that cut earlier is, is a better technique than right. sort of waiting it out and really... Yeah, and then forgetting all that material, the right. key material. It might be different now, obviously. I mean, things changed since yeah. I took that test, but um, I, I would say when it's fresh in your mind, it's, it's the best time to take it. Definitely. So that's the academic portion of medicine, right? About getting into medical school. Mm -hmm. How did you handle all the stress? So we talked about how you handled the academic portion where you were studying in groups, and really honing down on the material. But sometimes you are not perfect in these classes and it is important to mention that it is possible to not do well, let's say on a quiz or in one exam. It doesn't necessarily mean that 
you're never going to become a doctor, right? Of course. So, of course. I mean, you know, listen, there are over 100 medical schools. Not everyone has to go to Harvard, right? right. Um, <clears throat> I know a lot of great doctors that, that went to all sorts of different medical schools. Um, you know, uh, some people don't do well their first year or even their first two years of college, and they might be very discouraged. Um, and there are certainly weed out courses that a lot of people drop out of and never really pursue the medical path. And th I think that's fine. I think that a lot of those people realize that maybe they didn't want to go into medicine anyway. But for someone who earnestly wants to go into medicine, I don't think that you know one or two semesters or even three semesters um, should be you know a determination of your entire life pathway. You could recover from that. Um, there, you know, I, I know a lot of people that didn't do well their first year and got very discouraged and just forgot about the whole thing entirely. But then again, I know people that have you know stories that they did bad the first two years of college and then just really uh, kicked their butt into shape their last two years and did very well and got into medical school and now they're doctors and I don't think that they're any better or any worse than you know any other doctor I know but they had a different pathway per se um, and most people won't have a straightforward pathway you have to understand you know it's the exception when someone's getting all A's in, in every single class most people are not like that um, and so you know bumps in the road are are expected and I think that if you are able to tolerate those bumps in the road and recover from them all the power to you and you should continue you know your Definitely. pathway sometimes you will not get those A's you will not get perfect grades in your classes but as Dr. Mass said it is important to recover there are a few check marks I mean you know clearly you have to do well in the MCAT um, clearly you know you have to do well on your on your core classes but even so I, I think there there's room for for a lot of people in medical school and again, not every single person got straight A's and a 45 on their M MCAT. So, um, you know, again, I, I think it's important to understand that medical schools are looking not only for the grades, but also for someone who is well-rounded and has other experiences that they could bring to the table. Um, you know, so it, it's not always the standard pathway that will get you to where you want to get to. Got it. All right, well, thank you so much for your time, Dr. Mass. It's been a pleasure. You really showed us a lot about your personal experience and speaking to someone like you with such tremendous accolades in both research and clinical aspects of medicine is phenomenal. And I thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Take care.